If you have a Bible, open up to Song of Solomon, chapter 7. Today, we're going to finish up this series about Song of Solomon. If you haven't been here, don't worry about it. I'll make it all make sense. Um, I'm really only going to make one point from the book today, and I'm going to kind of transition us into where I want to go in the new year. Uh, I believe God's calling us to focus on cultural reformation. And um, what I mean by that is changing the way that we think personally and as families and as a church and et cetera. And as we do that, uh, people's lives can be changed and our city can be changed and people can come to know Jesus and a lot of powerful stuff can happen. Uh, so I'll develop that more in the coming days. But and th- th- there's lots more that can be said about these last chapters of Song of Solomon, um, but I really felt today to just n- narrow and zoom in on two verses and talk to you about mature partnership with Jesus. Everybody say partnership. Partnership. All right. So my thesis is that God wants a bride, not a slave. They're different. And uh, we're going to kind of try to understand what that means. So look at Song of Solomon 7, verse 11 through 13. We'll read this really quickly. It says, Come, my beloved, let us. Everybody say, "Let let us. Let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine flourish, whether the tender grapes appear and the pomegranates bud forth. And there I will give you my love. You'll remember this book is a prophetic picture of the relationship between Jesus and His bride, Jesus and the church. At the beginning of this book, Jesus is always coming to the bride and saying stuff like, come up here, come experience life with me, let's go do things together. That's when she's in immaturity. But as she grows throughout the book and she goes through a bunch of different things and crises in life and she learns that God is always with her and loves her no matter what, she begins to be more confident in who she is and she starts to say to Jesus, let us go and do these kinds of things. Amen. It's a dramatic switch. Later in this chapter, there's this question, who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? If you can get this picture, the wilderness is like the difficulties of life, and the bride of Christ is coming out of the difficulties in life, arm in arm with Jesus, leaning maybe with her head on her shoulder or something like you might see uh, a married couple that they've been together for a long time, and they've seen life's ups and downs, and yet they've got confidence together that together they can overcome anything. Amen. There's this picture of intimacy, and often couples that have been married a long time, it's like they have a language all their own. You know, Molly and I have been married 13 years, and there's a lot of things we don't even have to say anymore. We can just look at each other and typically know what what the other person's thinking. And you can imagine this kind of intimate relationship with Jesus, and that's how we come up out of um, the troubles in life. But you'll notice that she's leaning on him. That means they're side by side. So she's not below him, just following all the orders, and she's not running out ahead, just asking him to bless a bunch of random decisions she's making. Amen? They're, They're walking arm in arm together, doing life together. And I think this is a picture of what our lives are supposed to look like in Jesus. So I'm going to say some kind of intense stuff today. Um, so... Just, just be ready, all right? So, so I'm not trying to, to pick on anybody, but, but for a lot of Christians, uh, we tend to believe and think about the gospel this way, that the primary calling on humanity's lives is a moral calling. And we tend to think that what God really wants, if, if God really wants anything, it's just for us to keep the rules, Right? I mean, just don't screw something up. I mean, just don't eat the apple. (laughs) That's what he'd really like. And we screwed that up, didn't we? And that made God really mad. And the veins started to bulge out in his head. (laughs) And he wanted to come kill somebody. Because he was so ticked off because we ate the apple. 
But then rather than kill you, he thought, well, I'll just kill Jesus. And so then he brutally murdered Jesus. And now he felt better, and now you can go to heaven. All right, now that's a bit of a caricature. But for many people, if you, if you think about the gospel in terms of morality, it's, it's God wanted you to live right, you screwed up, Jesus died, now you're okay. There's some truth to that. But it's not the whole truth, and in fact, I think it's reductionary, meaning it reduces what Jesus did to something that's, that's less than what He actually meant to accomplish. So I'm going to try to explain to you what I think He actually meant to accomplish a little bit later. I want to talk to you today just about God's original intent in creating humanity, and we're going to go back to Genesis in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to give a quick disclaimer. We are into morality here, all right? Uh, we believe in living a moral lifestyle. I, I feel like it's silly to make that disclaimer, but when you preach grace the way I do, sometimes people are like, well, you're just trying to get people to sin. No. <laughs> Titus 2.11 says the grace of God will teach you to live holy. Amen. All right? So grace, if it's preached correctly and believed correctly, now you can take some of the stuff I say and go do something crazy, but grace, when it's properly understood, causes you to live holy. But my contention is that being moral isn't the highest calling on your life. Yeah, that's Amen. That's good. Yeah. Now, be moral. Your, your calling contains a moral calling, certainly. God's moral, right? Thank God. And so we want to be moral. I mean, Molly and I live our lives. I mean, we, we, if you know us, we're not, you know, we try to live holy, all right? <laughs> okay, but... That's not the, the highest calling. Let's go back and look at Genesis and see uh, what God actually said when He created humanity. Go to Genesis 2. I want to I kind of do this a little bit backwards. Genesis 2, we're going to read verses 18 through 20. And the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help meet for him or a helper suitable for him or an easier connect go, a power facing him. Um, All right, I want you to think about this for a minute. Adam is having all these animals come to him, and then God's saying, what are you going to call this one? If you believe that the primary calling on your life is a moral one, then what you think is God already, already knows the right name, and he's testing Adam to see whether or not he'll get it right. And I was actually at a conference, and a guy read it this way, and it says, you know, it says, and whatsoever Adam named him, that was the name thereof. And he's like, see, Adam got it right. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> Go back to Genesis 126. This is God's original statement when he makes man. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So what kind of things did Adam have dominion over? Everything on the earth. Does that include animals? Yeah. All right, so think about this. God, in eternity past, he's looking, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and he's thinking, I'm going to create a, a race of people that are like me. Amen. Now, one of the things that is about God is that he's in charge of a bunch of stuff. How many of you know God's in charge of a bunch of stuff? <laughs> I wouldn't want to be God, all right? God's in charge of a bunch of stuff. 
He says, I'm going to create a race of beings, and they're going to be like me. I'm going to create them in my image, in my likeness. What's that mean? Well, one of the things it means is they're going to be in charge of some stuff. What kind of stuff? Well, like planet Earth. Like the animals and the plants and all this stuff. Somebody said, why is the Earth so messed up? Well, who's in charge? <laughs> now, I'll say this. Why is there so much beauty on the Earth? Every good and perfect gift does come from above. Right? But are people capable of creating something genuinely beautiful? Yes. Sure they are. Why? Because they're made in God's image. Now look back at Genesis 2, verse 19. It says, <laughs> Out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. Where did, where did we just read that? We just read that in 126, right? He, brought, he made these things, and then he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Why does God bring the animals to Adam to see what he would name them? Because he's already given Adam charge over the animals. Because it's Adam's job. That's pretty simple, right? Why does, why does God bring him to Adam? It's, it's genuine to see what Adam's going to do. And Adam could name them whatever he wanted. Here's a really scary thought. There was no right answer. What Adam was supposed to do was use his creativity in partnership with God, not out ahead of God. God's there, right? He's not, he's not living outside relationship with God. But, but similarly, not just following the orders. God's not in his ear when the draft comes up. God's not like, it's a draft. <laughs> He's not. He's expecting Adam out of, out of relationship and out of recognition of who he is as an as a image bearer yes. to use his creativity and his uniqueness to name these animals. In doing so, he reflects the light of God on the earth. Yeah. Well, that's kind of intense when you think about it. What my belief is, is that God's desire for humanity is that we would reflect his glory on the earth by using our authority, creativity, and uniqueness to partner with him in forming order out of chaos. Yeah. Yeah. God, in the beginning, he's, there's chaos, there's all this craziness, the earth's without form and void, and so God speaks, and His words create things. Your words are still creating things. Yes. This, I think, is the high calling. Certainly we want to be moral, but the high calling is to be like God and use your creativity to bring heaven to earth. Yes. Now get this, how do you do that? You do it, you do it not in isolation from God. We're not saying God's a, a, like deist thing. Deist thinks that God creates the earth and then he just leaves. And then we're just, you know, do whatever. No, God's there with us. We have a relationship with God. But in that place of intimacy, I'd encourage you, if you weren't here on, on December 23rd, go back and listen to my message about dreams. It plays into this. Out of intimacy with God, Dreams are birthed, and those dreams are containers of heaven on earth. That's how it works. If that's true, then I want to suggest to you that our, our failure when we ate the apple wasn't so much a moral failure but a failure to operate as fully alive humans and a failure of worship. So look at Romans 1. Romans 1 describes what sin really is. 
Because, you know, we, we read these stories and you think about Adam eating an apple and you don't really think about it. You know why you think about it as an apple? Does the Bible say that? It says a fruit. John Milton in Paradise Lost said it was an apple. I know that because I was an English teacher. <laughs> Romans 1, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful. But they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into an image made, made like unto corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. All right, get this. What's sin about? It's when you quit worshiping God... That's what it's saying, right? And instead, you worship idols. Sin is, is when you quit worshiping God and you worship things like money, sex, fame, power, etc. And instead of God being your God, those things become your God. And those things begin to exercise power over you and control you. The fundamental failure then is that we quit or we, we started worshiping things that would control us yeah. wow. and we quit worshiping the one who won't. Yeah. Wow. That's about as good a thing as I've ever said to you. <laughs> it really is. God does not control people. And when you submit your life to Him, now, you want to live submitted. You want to give your life to Jesus. But when you give your life to Jesus, He's the only person who's, who will actually give it back. And then you live free. Which means when you choose with your freedom to worship Jesus, to creatively bring heaven to earth, then it's genuine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here's the amazing part. Then the dreams that are birthed and the stuff that happens in your life, it's, it's God filtered through you, filtered through your personality. That's why Paul's epistles sound like Paul. You ever notice that? If you read enough of Paul's epistles, you start to, he had a personality pretty strong personality. I think he was a D person, <laughs> if you know what that means. And go back and listen to my message on it. I have a, I have a go to my series on ties. We're, we're going to redo our website so it's easier to uh, access some of my stuff. So be patient with that. We, we had to, um, they updated the software and so it, it was confusing. But anyway, I'm figuring it out. No, I'm not. Daniel's helping me. But anyway. All right. When you find freedom in Christ and begin to embrace who you are, you get to be an authentic human, just like God created you to be. So, so Jesus' death is, in many ways, about breaking the bondage of idolatry over our hearts so that we can quit worshiping things that control us, and instead worship Jesus. And as we worship Jesus, then you get, you get choices. Now, you don't get authority over everything, right? But I get to name, I, I named my kids. Yeah. I did. Now we prayed about it. I didn't do it, I didn't do it out ahead of God. And I didn't, but I, I didn't really actually didn't fall in order either. It was something that was birthed out of intimacy. If you, there's things in my life, Molly and I have been married, you know, for a while, and, and we talk about a lot, we talk about ideas a lot. And if you were to ask us where certain ideas originated, you know, did it come from Molly, did it come from me, some of the stuff I'd be like, eh, not really sure. Because it was sort of birthed through fellowship. It ought to be that way between you and the Lord. Now, I mean, but pastor, what if God tells me, well, well do, do whatever God tells you to do. He is Lord. <laughs> okay? But 
And, and that's what the bride does at the beginning. She's just following orders. But after a while, she matures. And she starts to say, let us go do stuff. Let us go pray for that person. Let us go minister. Let us bring heaven to earth. Let us love on somebody. So I think that God's mission in Christ is not just about getting us to heaven. Now, thank God it is about that. But it's not just about that. It's about freeing us from the bondage of idolatry so we can return to our created purpose of shining the light of heaven on the earth. I wanted to give you three practical things that this means. Are you ready? I know it's some heady theology, but, but real practically, what, what it means is when you start to understand you, who you are, you live with a green light as a Christian. The green light is on. What's that mean? You got permission. To do what? Well, to do anything that in, the, in the Bible. <laughs> Matthew 10, 8 says, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Yeah. If you see a sick person, do you have permission to pray for them? Yes. Yes. Sure. If you see somebody that doesn't know Jesus, do you have permission to go witness to them? Yeah. Yeah. Sure you do. Do you have to get, do you have to, one of my favorite pastors, he used to, have a piece of lead in his desk. And so if people would come to him, they'd say, well, I don't feel led to love my spouse. He'd pull out this lead, <laughs> he'd put it in their hand, and he'd say, okay, now you felt led. Now go love your... <laughs> now go love your spouse. <laughs> oh, man. You don't need a specific word to do certain things. Now, you do have to look at the light, though. Because there's a difference between faith and presumption. And the light could turn yellow and it could turn red. So a great example of how this worked in Paul's life, I won't turn there, but, but in Acts you can find this scripture. He's trying to go to these different places and he's just going because he's got permission. Now why does he have permission? Well, because really three things. First of all, he's got Jesus' words which say, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Pretty clear, right? Jesus already told you to do it. What more do I need? But he also had personal encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and then later he, he had an encounter where Jesus showed him the gospel. So he had a personal commissioning. And then finally, you can find uh, in Acts, uh, I guess, what would it be, 12? I can't remember. Anyway, uh, he has a commissioning from an apostolic body. So a group of people like this pull him together, and, uh, uh, and, and send him out. Yeah. Okay? So if you really want to start some kind of ministry or something like that, you really ought to have those, those three things. But if you've got those three things, like Paul did, you've got a ton of permission. So just go out there and do stuff. But as he's doing stuff, the Holy Spirit said, don't go over here. Yeah. Now, what's that mean? Well, it means, it means he's just trying to go because there's people over there, and he's like, I've got to preach the gospel to somebody. The Holy Spirit says, for whatever reason, don't go over there. Why not? Well, it doesn't say. It doesn't matter. He is God, so we're going to follow His orders. Right. But you may not always get orders, so it, when you don't, just do what's in your heart. Yeah. Right. Amen. That's pretty simple, right? Yeah. A lot of Christians live paralyzed. Yeah. You don't have to live paralyzed. You, you're a son of God. Thank you're a daughter of God. The image of God's on the inside of you. So just, just be who you are. Amen. All right? Let her be. Reflecting the glory of God on the earth is about learning to dream with Him and see those dreams come to pass. So you've got permission to dream with God. It's one of the most powerful things you can do. You just spend time worshiping Jesus and just, just dream about what's possible in His kingdom. Before I was ever up here preaching to you guys, I dreamed about you. I really did. I spent a lot of time on my face before the Lord dreaming about this church. I wasn't out ahead of God. I, not in presumption. But neither was I just following orders. In fact, God told me, I'll never order you to plant a church. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean he's, uh, hear me, does that mean he's never ordered anybody to plant a church? No. no. But it means that, that he wanted me to do it in intimacy and partnership as, as the product of a dream. And I believe that's because it's, it's voluntary. 
And the, per and the presence of God only dwells permanently in that which is given voluntarily. So I believe there's a lot of glory here and there's going to be more. Amen. All right, and then lastly, the full meaning of Christianity is about being truly free, but then using your freedom to discover how you can use your gifts, talents, and abilities to form the chaos around you into something beautiful. How many of you can do that? Nobody raised their hand. You can, let's try that again. How many of you can do that? Amen. You can. you can. You can authentically be yourself. Sometimes it's just about forming beauty out of the chaos of my three children. I got a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a ten-month-old. But when I do that and I, and I enjoy life, that's, that's my purpose as a human. It's being fully alive. God wants a bride, not a slave. You know, I like my wife to have opinions. Yeah. All, the, all the men. Yes, do you yes. like your wife to have opinions? Oh, yeah. You do. Now, sometimes you might think you don't, but if she, just, <laughs> if she just did everything you wanted, first of all, it wouldn't be an authentic relationship. And second of all, you'd be really bored. You would be. Some of you don't believe me. Let's all stand up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Everybody all right? Yeah. So I think this is the summons on our life in this new year. We're going to figure out practical ways to be creative and partner with God to bring heaven to earth in different ways. Yeah. It's going to be fun. We're going to do it in small groups. We're going to do it in big groups. Next week, we'll have Pizza Sunday. We'll have small groups sign up the next couple weeks. You want to get involved in that. Anyway, I'm going to pray for everybody. If my prayer team can come down here. Um, I'm going to pray for everybody. If you need personal prayer in just a moment, you can come down and have somebody pray with you. We'd love to agree with you about whatever's going on in your life. Jesus loves you. He wants this to be the best year yet. My son, my five-year-old, he said, You know, Dad, God always saves the best for last said, that's right. That means no matter how good your life's been up till this point, God's got something better. Got something better coming. Amen. Everybody say this with me. Something good, something good. is about to happen to, to me. To Hallelujah. If you believe that, give the Lord a hand clap. <laughs> Father, we worship you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are not an authoritarian dictator but that you're also not an absentee dad and that you live with us every day and that in intimacy and fellowship with you, we get to partner with you to use our uniqueness and creativity to bring heaven to earth. And so we just enjoy doing this thing called life with you. We thank you, even in the ups and downs, that you're with us, that you never leave us, never forsake us. We thank you for an awesome 2019. We just believe you for dreams and people's hearts for those coming to pass and lives being changed and the kingdom expanding. In Jesus' holy name, amen.